All right. OK, cool. Um, hopefully, everyone on Zoom can hear me. All right. OK, so um, welcome, welcome, welcome. If you are here in person, thank you for, uh, for coming in person all of these days. I appreciate you guys being here. Uh, if you're on Zoom, thank you for uh, sticking with the course. If you're watching asynchronously, congratulations. We've made it to the very end. So um, today's lecture is going to be, like I've been saying, a little bit shorter. There's going to be no code involved. There's going to be no blackboarding involved. Uh, it's going to be a look at the journey that we've taken so far to get here, uh, all of the code that we've written, all of the visualizations that we've created, and, and sort of the commonalities between all of the code that we've written. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, how to create generative art beyond this course. So you now have the tools to create lots and lots of really cool and interesting patterns uh, outside of nature. And so we're going to talk about some of the possibilities of things that you can do now that you have this skill set. Uh, and then finally, we'll wrap it up with a few last questions to consider, a couple of tips from my, I guess now three or four years exploring and tinkering with uh, generative art. And then we will go ahead and call it a day. So let me go ahead and start by sharing my screen. Uh, hopefully you guys can all see that okay so let's go ahead and take a look at uh at our slides for the day all right so the first thing that i wanted to start with is just looking at how far we've come and so this is i think pretty much every single visualization that we've created throughout the entirety of this course except for one i didn't include the uh the bouncy ball visualization on here uh, but we'll we'll talk about that and we'll get to that in in a couple of minutes um and so i mean we really have covered a lot of stuff when you look at the amount of time that we've been talking the amount of like actual lecture time uh it's been i think a little bit less than uh, 11 hours I think after the end of this lecture, it will be a total of 12 hours of uh, us having been together. Uh, and so we've been able to create a lot in, in very little amount of time. And we'll talk about exactly why that is in just a second. We'll talk about all the commonalities between the things that we have created. Uh, but I did want to take a second just to see every single pattern that we've visualized all on one screen. OK, so. Um, this is where I think the course gets really interesting. We've talked about this a little bit throughout the course. We've mentioned it at the beginning of lectures or in the middle of, of coding, but I don't think we've really taken a step back and talked about the commonalities between every single pattern that we've created. And so uh, this is a, a small snapshot on screen here. So the coffee cup pattern that we created is a fractal, and that fractal or a fractal can be generated stochastically using the chaos game, which is something that we looked at, or we can create it recursively, which we did through our tree, or again, using cellular automata, which we looked at with rule 90 in Sierpinski's triangle. And interestingly enough, the same cellular automata that we could use to create fractals, we can also use to create artificial life, which we saw through Conway's game and through Boyd's, right? And then again, Conway's game, if you take that pattern and you make a very small change to it, we get maze-like structures. And we talked about all sorts of, of other connections between the course. But what I really want to emphasize is that every single fractal, image, cellular automata, like all of them come together in this really nice story that builds on top of each other. And yes, to some extent, uh, when designing this course, I wanted there to be some sort of continuity between these patterns, but not all of it is contrived. A lot of these patterns really do work very well together uh, in the real world. And like I said, if you have the tools to make just some of this stuff, you have the tools to make so, so, so much of it. Um, and I think that's a really, really awesome aspect of uh, generative art and, and this course. All right, so now that we've talked about uh, that, I really do want to get into some of the specific topics and applications that we've looked at uh, throughout this course and show you how those fit together. Okay, so we covered a bunch of different concepts, but at the heart of things were six different concepts. And I think if you understand these six concepts, you have a very strong understanding of how to create pretty much any pattern that you want. The first one is randomness. So you'll recall the first time we saw randomness was in our very first lecture when we talked about random walks. And then we saw randomness come up once more uh, in our third lecture 
where we talked about the chaos game. And we used randomness in lots and lots of different places throughout uh, the entirety of the course content, uh, but these are the, the two places that it showed up the most. Now, once you understand randomness, there's a lot that you can do with it, and it's a very powerful tool that you can use to supplement your understanding of existing concepts uh, other than randomness. Uh, one concept that I think is super integral, regardless of what pattern you're visualizing, is that of the like coordinate system and how to manipulate coordinate systems, especially in processing, to make your life easier. And so the first time we talked about coordinate systems really uh, rigorously was through our fractal tree. Remember, we were doing things like pushing and popping matrices and moving our coordinate system around a lot, and that turned the process of making a fractal tree, which otherwise like, would have been quite complicated, into something that is extremely simple. Right? We, instead of having to worry about drawing a bunch of different branches, only had to worry about drawing one line, one branch, and then we let uh, the coordinate system and recursion take care of the rest, which makes it a really, really powerful tool. The second time we saw coordinate systems at play was with Conway's Game of Life. And again, we weren't doing complicated stuff here. We just had to understand exactly how our coordinate system worked so that we could put cells next to each other in a grid. And once we understood that, everything else was just messing with some of the attributes of uh, the cells themselves and taking Conway's game of life's rules and applying them to the coordinate system that we created. The third bit of, uh, of stuff that I think is really important to generative art that we've covered is algebra and trig. Uh, oh, my bad. Uh, okay, back to coordinate systems for a second. Uh, the cellular automata mazes, just like Conway's game, we used coordinate systems there. I mean, it's really the exact same concept, the exact same way. Okay, so algebra and trig. Uh, we saw that we used algebra and trig a fair bit throughout this course, and I've, as you can see on screen, I've separated out vectors and forces from algebra and trig, uh, but in reality, a lot of the vector and force stuff that we've talked about is algebra, uh, but we saw algebra and trig being used for the first time with our coffee cup example, and we saw how powerful it was. If you just take very basic concepts, like understanding how points are situated around a circle, if you have a basic understanding of sine and cosine, how that can turn into some very, very pretty patterns. The second time we saw algebra and trig really being used was in the chaos game, again with the same general concept. If you understand just a little bit of trig, if you understand just a little bit of algebra with the midpoint formula, you can create some really, really powerful stuff that mimics a lot of the patterns that we see in nature. Okay, uh, next topic is object-oriented programming. Um, Understanding objects and object-oriented programming is really critical to being able to uh, scale up or down our generative art visualizations, uh, and that makes a big difference when we talk about scale. We also saw objects being used when it came to voids, uh, and those are going to be really, really important, again, for the exact same reasons. If we're able to understand exactly how objects work, then we can scale them up, scale them down, and that's what gives generative art uh, an edge, I think, over a lot of conventional art is your ability to scale up and down. All right, moving right along um, with mazes. We saw that objects aren't just useful tools for scaling, but objects also give us the ability to uh, change the nature of a visualization. The visual uh, might be one aspect of like how we understand things, but thinking of things in terms of objects in term, uh, instead of in terms of the visualization itself also makes a really big difference. This maze is a good example because it would have been difficult to try and create a maze where we were thinking of everything as a line or just a wall, but it's a lot easier to think of the maze as a set of objects that have walls that can be turned on and off. And when we think about things in that context, uh, that makes the process of creating the visual a lot easier. And so I want to emphasize that objects aren't just useful uh, in scaling up or down a visualization, but also in terms of thinking of a visualization in a way that might benefit you as somebody that wants to create a particular piece. Vectors and forces, these are going to be really, really useful to us depending on uh, the type of visualization that we want to create. 
We saw them being useful in our bouncy ball simulation. Uh, but of course, the vast majority of the time that we talked about vectors and forces in the context of natural visualization was in terms of these voids. Um, and you'll see them pop up a lot more if you're interested in doing physics simulations uh, or something of that nature. And the final topic that I want to talk about is recursion. We, of course, saw this a lot with our fractal trees over and over. All we were really doing was recursing. And then we saw it again in our last lecture where we talked about mazes. And so what you'll see is, I mean, really, the difference between the last slide, where we showed off every single one of the visuals, and this slide, where we've laid them out, is uh, it's, it's kind of staggering. Because when you look at every single one of these visualizations by themselves, you can't really tell the connections that can be drawn between them. It seems like you would probably have to use a very different paradigm, a very different skill set to create a fractal tree versus a maze versus a random walk versus a snowflake. Uh, but indeed, we know that that's not the case. A strong understanding of six simple concepts gives you everything that you need in order to mess with these visualizations and create new ones uh, as you desire. All right. We'll move away from talking about the connectivity after this slide, uh, but I also want to emphasize this stuff that we talk about is everywhere. Uh, you can see on screen a picture of my dinner from last night at Lehman Hall, and I was, I was just putting my tray down, and I was like, wait a second, in my water cup, there's the exact same coffee cup fractal. And so if you're looking for this stuff, it really is everywhere. And once you know that it's there, once you've you know, taken a second to understand some of these patterns, you will see them a lot more in your daily life. Uh, but this stuff isn't just relevant to your daily life. It's also an important part of academia more broadly. Um, and I think the perfect example of that is, uh, is today's uh, Quanta Magazine top story. If we scroll right down, the first thing that we see is a, a really cool article on Conway's Game of Life. And I mean, of course, you know, I don't know the folks over at Quanta. It would have been cool if I could have just been like, hey, put, uh, put Conway's Game on the uh, on the very top of your site, uh, but this is uh, this is stuff that is happening all the time. The patterns that we looked at in this course are ones that you see pop up all the time in academia as well, uh, and so this stuff really is ubiquitous. All right, okay. So transitioning away from the connectivity of everything that we've talked about in this course, I want to tell you guys a little bit about uh, the possibilities that are out there beyond just creating visualizations of nature and displaying on them on screen like we've done here. Um, and so I want to talk about it a little bit in the context of uh, an art gallery that I had the opportunity to host a couple of months ago, uh, back in April of 2023. Um, and this was while I was an undergrad at Georgia. Um, I want to shout out the, the folks over at the UGA Arts Collaborative for making this uh, event possible and giving me the grant to do it. Uh, but this was a really fun experience. So I took uh, a lot of the work that I had been doing in the digital space and I moved it into the analog space uh, by plotting it out using a pen plotter, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Um, but this was a really, really interesting process. And I want to touch on it uh, not only to tell you guys a little bit about the possibilities uh, of stuff to do in this space, but also to mention some of the constraints that uh, we don't realize we have when we're working entirely in the digital space. So uh, this art gallery was a lot of fun. The idea behind it was to get people to engage uh, more with concepts that we see uh, in math or in physics or in the natural world. As you can see on the uh, bottom right, we see some of our Boyd flocks there visualized in interesting ways. On the uh, bottom left there, we see a couple of uh, our mazes that we've generated in 3D. Um, and so there's lots of cool stuff to be done in this area. But the most interesting thing about running a gallery or an exhibit like this using generative art is having to bridge the gap between uh, digital spaces and analog ones. So as you can see, sort of uh, in the uh, middle there, I did have a digital element going on. Um, and that was very easy. But the hard part is, is being able to take what are otherwise animations uh, and use the constraints that we have of like working with the physical world, working with paper, working with pen, working with imperfection, uh, and, and working with 
static images rather than, than dynamic animations and bringing that all into the real world. And so it's a really fun experience. Uh, the reason that I want to tell you guys about it is that not only is it a possibility for something that you might be interested in doing, but also before I had done this art gallery, you know, through like years of doing this generative art stuff, through like even the TED talk, I had never printed out one of these pieces and really held it in my hand. And holding a piece of, of art that you would otherwise see on a computer in my hand on paper was a very, very like amazing experience. It made a much bigger difference than I think uh, it should have. Um, and so I would recommend that if you guys are interested in this space and you've been making art like this, try printing some of it out at some point. Um, it'll make maybe a big difference to how you see the art that you create. Okay, um, the next thing that I wanna cover uh, briefly is the different possibilities of stuff that you can do with IO. So we've been working exclusively with just processing here. We've just been writing code and we visualize it in the way that processing uh, sort of wants us to, using their canvas, using all of their tools. Uh, but there's a whole world of really, really interesting input and output uh, mechanisms that we can use to create cool and interesting generative art. The first one that I want to mention is the AxiDraw. This is a really cool pen plotter by a company called Evil Mad Scientist. Awesome name, by the way. Um, and this is the only product that I have used pretty extensively. Um, the idea behind it is super simple. You just take whatever piece of generative art you've created and uh, you feed the uh, like a vector of that image that you've created into this machine and it will plot that image out on whatever piece of paper or, or plastic or whatever you want. Uh, and you can, of course, choose what you put in it. So you can put something like a pencil in or a pen in for something that's a little bit more conventional, but you can also really play with what you use uh, to bring your digital art into the physical space by using something like a paintbrush or a glitter pen or something like that. And so that's one cool piece of IO. Uh, the other second piece of I.O. that I want to mention is that second image on the top that you see. Um, it is, it's just your hand. And I thought this was the coolest thing when I saw it. Uh, so I think processing has a couple of different computer vision libraries. And of course, there's stuff like OpenCV that you can totally use. But a really nice way of making our generative art more interactive is to move beyond things like the mouse and the keyboard that we've been using in class and instead use things like gesture control, which is really not that difficult to um, integrate into your processing projects as it may first seem. And it really is an incredible experience to uh, use your hand to be able to control whatever piece of art you have on screen. And that's a lot of fun that you can mess with. Okay, um, the third thing that I want to talk about is uh, like a Wacom tablet or like a drawing tablet. And these can be had for super, super cheap. I think I have one for like $20. So there shouldn't be a, a very big financial burden on getting one of these. But the possibilities with one of these, I think, is endless. Uh, it makes a big difference if you're doing something like creating uh, a painting simulation or even if you want to add some element of like flow and smoothness to the interactivity that you have in your generative art. Instead of using a mouse, using a, a tablet can be a very nice alternative. Now, I want to skip over the uh, laser engraver and the uh, 3D printer, which you see over on the far right there. And I'll bring your attention down to uh, the MIDI and synth space. So what I have there is an OP1 by uh, Teenage Engineering. Um, and I mean, there's a lot of work that you can do mixing audio visual components uh, into your generative art. And I think one great way of doing that, that is getting yourself a physical synth or a physical MIDI, hooking that up to processing uh, and really having a lot of fun with visualizing music or creating sounds based on like algorithms that you develop. So sort of going both ways with the audio visualization there. Uh, another really cool piece of kit that can be had for relatively cheap is an LED light array. So just a physical uh, panel that consists of maybe like eight or 10 LEDs on each side. 
Um, I, it's a really, really cool constraint to have because instead of working with a high definition screen where I can very quickly say, all right, I want like a 2000 by 2000 pixel canvas and I can create some very nice imagery, you're really limited here in terms of the amount of colors or images or shapes that you can show at a time. Uh, and I think that constraint creates lots of very creative pieces. But the other flip side of things is I think having some sort of physical thing that looks like a screen but is not like a traditional screen on your laptop or a monitor or even like projected onto a wall. I think the cool thing about that is people really like touching it or playing with it. It's really like fascinating to be able to work with just even as a generative artist. Uh, and so I've gotten to play with I think one or two of these uh, and it's always been an incredible experience. So I think this is a really fun piece of IO to work with as well. Okay, and finally, moving on to some of some of the pretty expensive stuff, we have laser engravers or 3D printers, uh, and both of these are relatively interesting uh, just because they're new mediums uh, to like sort of take your generative art and move it into the physical space, uh, especially with 3D printing. I think this is going to be a little bit tougher, and maybe you need a little bit more uh, hardware knowledge and 3D modeling knowledge to just be able to do this right out of the box with processing. Um, but it definitely is possible. I think there are a couple of really cool artists who do it, uh, and maybe I'll drop them in the Slack a little bit later. Laser engraving is going to be very similar to the AxiDraw, uh, but of course your, your options are for customization uh, and materials are going to be a lot broader here. Okay, so that's I.O. Um, Moving on to data and music visualization. So again, in terms of the stuff that you can do with this space, we're not limited to just visualizing patterns in nature. And I, I wanted to show off a couple of really cool visualizations that I think might get you guys interested in other spaces beyond just mathematical and natural visualization. So on the top left there uh, is actually a piece that I made uh, as a part of Georgia Tech's hackathon, I wanna say a year or two ago. Um, and so this is a Wikipedia visualizer. Basically, whenever you go on Wikipedia, you go to a page and there's all sorts of like internal links that take you interesting places to things that have connections to whatever wiki page you're on, right? Um, and I think like a year or two ago, uh, there was this pretty cool game uh, that people were playing where you had to get from one Wikipedia page to another within a certain amount of clicks or within a certain amount of time, only using those internal connections. And so for the hackathon, uh, a couple friends and I got together and we used uh, P5, so just processing JavaScript variant, uh, and we created a visualization engine that would create like a 3D undirected graph where you could put in a Wikipedia page of your choosing and you would see some of the uh, internal wiki links that come out of it. Uh, and so I think that's still hosted on my website. Uh, if anybody's interested, Feel free to go check it out with the with the uh, knowledge that this was built over like 36 hours and we were all quite sleep deprived and so it might be a little buggy. Um, the next one to the right of that is uh, by Mike who runs a really cool blog uh, with some of this stuff. And this is a simple tutorial on basic audio visualization using processing. So if you take in some sound and you want to visualize it, it's super, super simple to get started with that and have some great animations coming out of that. And so I link that tutorial if anybody's interested. Uh, moving our way to the bottom, uh, we've been talking about physics simulations a little bit. If you want a good idea of what like a cool physics simulation might be, and you're interested in some of the chaos stuff that we talked about, uh, Daniel Schiffman really is just like the king of processing. He's got all sorts of tutorials on YouTube. Uh, he's got all sorts of cool visualizations. And the one that I wanted to show you guys here is a very simple double pendulum vi visualization. So if you guys are interested in some of the uh, like more rigorous math uh, that might go into a physics simulation, maybe this double pendulum is a nice place to start. Okay, and then really getting into like more data focused visualizations. Um, on the like middle, on the bottom there, I have a visualization from John, who is a professor over at UW uh, in the computer science department. And uh, I found this visualization a couple of uh, weeks ago, and I thought it was incredible. So uh, with most of these, I just wanted to show you guys the static images, but for this one, I do wanna go ahead and show you guys the visualization itself. Um, actually, let me stop sharing real quick. Let me make sure that I'm sharing with sound.
Okay. Um, cool. Yeah. So this one is is really really nice. Um, let me go ahead and run that. Hopefully you guys can hear it. Okay, so uh, yeah, uh, incredible, uh, incredible work that he did there, and it's uh, you can see all of the code. It is a fair bit of code, but it really isn't that much for I mean, like all of the stuff that was happening on screen. Also, a great song, I might add. Um, but yeah, so that is uh, one thing that you can do with the audio visual space. And the very last thing that I want to show you guys really focus on the data visualization space with processing in P five. Um, is by an artist named Shifts, uh, and he created a very simple visualization which tracks COVID-19 cases. And so you can see the amount of infections that we've had, the amount of deaths that we've had, the amount of people that have recovered from the disease over time. Um, and again, this is a visualization that is powerful. It shows you a lot, but it's very, very simple. I mean, I think really all that uh, Shifts did was took a picture of a map, uh, got a bunch of COVID-19 data, threw that into a CSV file, and then used Java, JavaScript to parse that CSV, and then just draw circles based on like the longitude and latitude of these cases. Totally something that you could have done maybe even after like our first or second lecture, uh, but a very strong and powerful visualization uh, depending on uh, your use case for something like that. Okay, so. Uh, we're we're going to go ahead and get just a little bit closer to wrapping things up. Uh, we've talked about the connections between all of the different pieces that we've created so far. We've talked about all of the different stuff that you can do in this field. And there is just so much more that even I don't know about that you could totally do. Uh, so if you're interested in what you can do outside of natural and mathematical visualization, don't take this slide deck to be uh, you know, gospel in terms of uh, your limitations and constraints, there's really so much more uh, that is out there that I would encourage you to explore. So I want to spend the last two slides uh, talking a little bit about a couple of lessons that I've learned, if you guys are interested in continuing with this sort of stuff, um, and then a couple of questions and puzzles that you might explore uh, moving forward if you want to continue these sorts of visualizations. So the first thing uh, that I've learned that I sort of want to talk to you guys about uh, is being purposeful with your code. So when I first started out with processing, uh, it was just me. It was during COVID. This is actually how I started is uh, I had taken a couple of intro computer science classes, uh, but I was, you know, shut in my room during uh, the beginning of the pandemic and I didn't really have very much to do. I wanted to mess with more computer science. And so I downloaded processing and I got started. Uh, and the, the big mistake that I think I made at the beginning that I made for probably like months after that was not being purposeful with the code that I wrote. I would often think to myself, all right, maybe like what if I introduce randomness? What if I draw a circle there? What if I do points in, in this sort of line? And I wouldn't think about what that would create. I would just sort of do stuff and hope that it created a pattern or visualization that was interesting to me. And it took me a long time to break that habit. And I think it's a really important habit uh, that you break if you've sort of started down that line. Uh, I think instead, a much better way of approaching things, even if you don't know what you want to create, is think first about what sort of function you might want to use. Think about how that will affect your visualization and have a sort of like mental image for what will come out uh, when you press that play button instead of just saying, oh, well, you know, what could be interesting is if I use the randomness function or if I use this noise function or if I, you know, use any sort of other function. And so being purposeful with your code, I think it, it really makes a big difference. Um, and it's, I think, a relatively common pitfall that people make when they first get started with processing. Now, I do want to say being purposeful with your code is not the same as constraining yourself or not exploring the different uh, like landscape that processing has to offer or that visualization more broadly has to offer. I think exploration is really, really important. And you should be 
uh, very comfortable messing with functions that you've never seen before and learning how to use them. But I think that it also has to be balanced a little bit with being purposeful. Uh, the second one, and this is a really big one, learn visual debugging. So when we start computer science, right, when you've taken your first computer science class, your best friend when you are debugging is the if, uh, the print statement, right? You know exactly what happens at every single state. Uh, and the exact same idea is tempting to carry over into the generative art, creative coding, and visualization space. We think to ourselves, oh, well, this isn't working properly. Let me print out exactly what's happening. And that's certainly a fine way of going about things at the beginning. But what I found to be a lot more useful and powerful is understanding how to debug things visually. Nothing showing up on screen? Well, hold on, let me do a sanity check. Let me draw just a circle in the middle of the screen. And maybe that'll tell me if the problem is more structural with the way that I've set up the canvas or if what I actually want to visualize isn't working, but everything is fine on the back end and I've made some sort of like logic error. Being able to debug visually makes all the difference in the world um, when it comes to stuff like this. And we've talked uh, a little bit about debugging here and there uh, throughout this course, maybe a, a little bit more subtly when I've messed up a little bit of the code uh, or when I wanted you guys to catch something that I was doing wrong with the code. And I think that is important to talk about because uh, you know, we're, we're all going to be debugging. Even the best programmer is going to have uh, some sort of code that they think works and then just doesn't for whatever reason. And I think the thing that separates uh, good programmers from great programmers is their ability to debug effectively. And oftentimes debugging in the generative art space or in the visualization space uh, looks different from debugging with regular computer science applications. Okay, uh, third thing, don't get bogged down with minutia. And we've mentioned this a fair bit throughout the course as well. I've told you guys very often, this is Java minutia, don't worry about it. This is processing minutia, don't worry about it. And certainly at some point you're going to have to learn these specific ways of doing things for Java or processing or JavaScript or whatever language or tool that you use. And that is important, uh, but I would recommend not getting bogged down with it. The overall idea is a lot more important than the specific implementation for one thing or another. And where I really want to emphasize this is with programming language, because this is something that I was stuck on for the longest time. I loved all of the visualizations that I was creating, but I only knew Java. I didn't know any JavaScript. And in order to run a lot of this stuff that I was visualizing on the web, I needed to learn JavaScript. Um, and for a long time, I was like, oh, you know what? It's fine. I'm not going to learn JavaScript. I don't want to learn an entirely new programming language. It's going to be a hassle. Uh, until eventually one day, you know, I reached a tipping point with it. And I was like, all right, I'll sit down. I'll learn the JavaScript. And what I found and what maybe the more advanced programmers amongst you have found well before I did is that the language really doesn't matter all that much. Yes, it is kind of a pain to learn a new syntax or it's a pain to have to debug something that you know would work in the language that you're familiar with but doesn't in this new language. Uh, that minutia really is just, uh, it's just a hassle, it's a pain. Don't get bogged down with it. The idea is the concept. And that takes us to the next lesson. Learn the concepts, not the code. There's so many great tutorials about processing on the internet, which is a like big double-edged sword, in my opinion. Um, on the one hand, if you want to learn how to do something, there is probably someone out there that has already done it before and has released a great tutorial about exactly how to do it. Uh, but getting caught up in the code uh, can be really, really problematic because then you're focused on learning the code and not learning how to create effective and interesting visualizations. I think some of the best generative artists that I've seen are not programmers, they are not computer scientists, they are mathematicians, they are physicists, they are biologists, they are people that are not computer science people that know these concepts very, very well. They have an intimate knowledge of their specific domain and they're able to take that knowledge and apply it to the computer science. So even though generative art is something that you absolutely need to know coding for, coding should not be, I think, your focus. And that's, that's something that I learned quite late in my journey. Uh, a lot of the time I was focused on using generative art as a way of writing good code, new code, clean code. And it wasn't until I hit 
uh, a barrier uh, where I realized my computer science knowledge isn't what's holding me back. It's my knowledge of math or it's my knowledge of like these physics concepts. Uh, and so I think that makes a big difference in your, in your generative art journey. Along the same lines, Wikipedia is your best friend. If you go back through these slides and you check out some of the sources that I've included, I think almost all of them are like from Wikipedia uh, for good reason. I think that the best way to get started with a lot of this stuff is go to the Wikipedia page for it. Chances are they have a pretty decent explanation of what's going on. And a lot of the time, they won't have the code associated with the visualization. It's not always the case for like the maze generation and maze solving um, Wikipedia pages. I think they totally include the code, but I think not having the code there and really having to sit down and read through the concept is going to be a great way of learning all of this stuff. It is the way that I create visualizations now. If I'm interested in something, I go to the Wikipedia page, I learn the concept, and then I think about how to convert that concept into code instead of going straight to the code and being like, oh, okay, this is how other people have done it. This is, this is how you should do it as well. Uh, the other reason that I think Wikipedia is your best friend when it comes to generative art is the related topics pages. Uh, with a lot of the concepts that we've covered so far, we've really only looked at the tip of the iceberg. And the problem is it's difficult to know where the rest of the iceberg is and what it consists of uh, if you don't already have a little bit of background knowledge in the topic. Um, and this is something that I've run into a bunch. I think the related topic section on Wikipedia is an easy way to click around and really understand what other topics might be related uh, to a particular topic that you're interested in. That might be useful to you for two reasons. The first, maybe you find just a different topic more appealing to you. Um, and, and that exploration element, I think, is important. But second, and perhaps more importantly, is if you understand where a topic fits within the sphere, the broader sphere of generative art or creative coding or visualization, or even just like the topic itself, can this be applied to like cellular automata? Is this a fractal? Is this system chaotic or dynamic? If you understand where this topic lies relative to other topics, very quickly you'll build for yourself in your mind a map of how you can visualize something based on what it relates to. Um, and this is something that happened for me relatively recently where I've been able to come across a topic and be like, oh wait, I've seen something like that in like the cellular automata space. And so that gives me an idea of where to code from. Um, and again, this is, this is a pitfall that I, I fell into is just learning a single topic and then not focusing on the stuff that was uh, surrounding it, either because I didn't have time or because I didn't find it interesting. Um, and this is something that I've realized like relatively recently. Okay, the last two ones. Uh, the first one, go outside. Um, I think being outside, uh, especially for some of the questions that I will talk about in the, the next slide, uh, makes a world of difference. I think it really makes some of the generative art and the visualizations come to life if you have a good idea of what it is in nature you've, you're visualizing. If you've seen it, you've touched it, you've smelled it, uh, I, I think it, it makes the process a lot more fun. And the very last part, uh, the very last lesson is just asking these what if questions. Uh, our coffee cup example is a great example because if we want to visualize the actual thing that we see, it's very simple and very straightforward and we can totally be done there. Uh, but if you literally just make one change, if you change that multiplication value and you just begin incrementing it, or you change it to a completely different value entirely, you get a new visualization. And so asking these what if questions will help you not only convert visualizations into art, they will not only help you understand what would happen if the world was slightly different, uh, but I think they're also useful because asking these what if questions over and over helps you create art where you understand why each parameter is important. What would happen if you change this parameter? Why does this parameter make the visualization work the way that it does? Um, and I think that's crucial not only to being a good generative artist, but also to being a good computer scientist, a good programmer, a good academic, a good scientist. Um, and generative art is a really easy way of like approaching these topics. All right, very last slide. Uh, questions to consider on your next walk. So if, you are, uh, if you're outside and you see any of this stuff, uh, maybe 
Maybe you'll find it interesting if you want something new to visualize. Maybe this has a couple of things uh, that you can, you can visualize. So the first one uh, that I want to talk about, what are the differences between fish schooling and bird flocking? So we've talked a little bit about bird flocking and boys throughout the, the course, especially in that last lecture. But birds aren't the only species or like animals that display some sort of flocking behavior, right? Fish totally do too. And fish are in a very different environment than birds are, obviously. Uh, and so how does that environment affect fish schooling? Um, and maybe this is a question that you consider for yourself the next time you see a school of fish, uh, either in real life or on YouTube. Or, I mean, there's also a, a bunch of really cool academic work that has been done uh, about considering the differences between fish schooling behavior and bird flocking behavior. And there's tons of other animals that exhibit some sort of flocking behavior, right? We know ship, uh, sheep and goats also exhibit flocking behavior. What are the differences uh, between those and, and bird flocks? What parameters might be interesting or important to change with our Boyd simulation to visualize sheep or goats or fish? Um, maybe you're not around fish very often. Maybe you don't live close to water. Uh, and so another question that you can ask yourself on your next walk is, do you see more fractals in the trees or in the flowers? And I think this is an important question to consider as well, uh, because we visualize stuff like fractals in trees, uh, but we haven't talked about them in flowers. And yet you can totally see fractals in the exact same places. And so a question that you might ask yourself, completely apart from the visualization aspect of things, is are there more fractals in trees or in flowers? Uh, which trees, which flowers? And is that a function of where you are, um, where you're walking? Is that a function of the season? Is that a function of, like, what is it a function of? All right, uh, the next question to consider, the very last big uh, question that you can really consider during your walks, is if you live in New York or DC or San Francisco or Chicago, it turns out that these cities are grid-like, which is really, really cool, uh, because if you, if you really squint, you might think of them a little bit like cellular automata. And so what rules might govern the way that cells or city blocks in these cities are alive or dead, whether they're full of people or they're empty? And of course, we can come up with all sorts of good reasons. We can contrive good reasons very quickly. Uh, maybe it's just time of day. Maybe depending on the area, if you're looking at like the financial districts, they might be like very active between a particular set of hours. But if you look at uh, like other districts, they might be uh, they might have quite different hours that they're alive or dead, full of people or completely empty. And so we can totally think about the world that we live in as cellular automata if you're willing to squint. Uh, Boston is, as you guys probably know, not laid out like a grid. It's laid out like a maze, a very confusing one. It's, uh, it's difficult to get around sometimes. And even that is quite interesting to think about. If Boston looks a little bit more like a maze than a grid, what type of algorithm might generate mazes that look similar to the way that Boston looks? And we didn't talk about any other maze generation algorithms other than our randomized depth first search. But there's tons that uh, we, we might have like mentioned in passing, like Prim's uh, randomized Prim's or randomized Kruskal's algorithm, or even Wilson's algorithm, uh, that create all sorts of mazes that look different uh, than maybe the maze that we've generated using a randomized DFS. So which algorithm could be used to produce a maze that looks like Boston. And again, if you're using your imagination, there's lots of like fun ways to frame this question. Obviously, Boston wasn't intentionally created like a maze, but it might be fun to think about if there was a designer of Boston, what algorithm they could have used to create the entirety of it, and what Boston might look like had, had they used a different algorithm. It might be nice to place things uh, around the Boston area that you already know uh, with a different maze generation algorithm than, than one that produces a very Boston-like maze. The very last question that I want to mention, uh, and this was, this was pretty critical to uh, the TED Talk. It was very central in the TED Talk. Uh, it is, is math discovered or invented? And I think this is maybe the biggest question uh, of all uh, because it holds lots and lots of very deep 
uh, implications not only for the scientific community but also more broadly philosophically right it is if you uh, are willing to engage with it in that way a religious question it's certainly a philosophical question it is definitely a mathematical question uh, but in a lot of ways it's also a biological question a chemical question uh, in some ways it might even be a computer science question and there's lots of very smart people in a lot of very smart disciplines that have considered this question as it relates to their field. But what I really like about this question, the, the reason that I like to frame generative art through the lens of this question, is because despite it being a very big question, I think everybody can very quickly form an opinion about it. Um, you don't need to be a mathematician or a philosopher, uh, a theologian, to have an opinion about this question, and it is in many ways shaped by the generative art that we create and the nature that we see. Uh, what does it mean, right, that we were able to use such simple methods, three simple rules, to visualize something like bird flocking? And certainly the way that we did it, yes, was imperfect, but it was a, it was a model that really wasn't all that bad. Make a couple of slight modifications, uh, maybe if you look at the problem set uh, for last lecture, we introduced some modifications to make things more realistic. Make some small modifications, mess with a little bit of the code, and you get some very nice complex behavior that mimics the real world in lots and lots of ways. Um, it might also be interesting, right, we talked about how we went through the entirety of this course using really only algebra and trig, and we were able to visualize lots of interesting stuff. What does it mean that we were able to visualize some really complex patterns using such simple math? Um, and I, I leave all of these questions very open-ended intentionally. I think it's good to come up with these answers for yourself, uh, but these are only answers that you can come up with, I think, if you engage with uh, these patterns, not only in the real world, uh, but you engage with them on the generative art level, and you really are able to break down things that you see in the real world in the context of art and math and code, and are able to take those ideas and reduce them down to their most fundamental building blocks. All right, awesome. Any questions, comments about anything that we have uh, discussed in lecture? Cool, so that is going to take us through to the very end of our course here. Thank you guys so, so much for being a part of this course. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I mean, when I first heard that I would have the opportunity to teach this course, and then I saw like 120 people sign up for this course, I was like, whoa, that's incredible. Um, and so whether you are on Zoom, whether you guys are here in person, or uh, you're watching asynchronously, thank you for committing the last 12 hours or so of lecture to, uh, bless you, to uh, learning about visualization and generative art. If you guys are interested, um, I'm working on making this course entirely public, and so uh, I'll keep you guys posted. If you guys have any friends that you want to send a particular lecture to, uh, feel free to do that. All of the uh, course stuff that we've created, the slides, the code, will remain forever free and open on my GitHub, which is linked down below. Um, and if you guys ever have any questions about any of this stuff, let me go ahead and stop sharing my screen so you guys can see the uh, board. If you guys have any questions um, about code or about uh, patterns or about any of this stuff, I'm more than happy to chat. You guys can write me an email. Hi at Sudan dot dev. Uh, if I have graduated uh, from Harvard, let me move this up. Um, or uh, if I'm still here, if you guys are around, you can also just reach me uh, at my full name. At g dot Harvard. Edu. All right, awesome guys. Uh, with that, we will go ahead and conclude our very final lecture. Again, thank you guys so much for coming and being here. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing everything cool that you guys create.